If almost everyone on Earth was dead, and you were mankind's last chance for survival, what would you do? Entire cities are overrun by zombies, and even the humans can't be trusted not to stab you in the back. So I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the end of the world in Maze Runner The Scorch Trials. A solar flare has destroyed life as we know it, and a virus is turning everyone into bloodthirsty zombies. This young man is very special, and he's the only one who holds the key to beating the deadly apocalypse. Thomas and his friends here have just been rescued from a death maze. As they wait around hungry and dirty in a high-tech building, they are greeted by this smug man, Mr. Jansen. He takes credit for saving them all and tells the group that he runs the facility. He explains that while a solar flare and a virus has wiped out most of the world, the teens will be safe here until they can find new homes. The boys are given a shared bunk and are sent to many rounds of medical tests. The only girl, Teresa, is separated from the others and kept under close guard. Thomas is taken to see Jansen. The whole place looks like an interrogation room, and the boys see his cameras watching. Jansen only has one question for him. He wants to know if Thomas is loyal to Wiki, the boy's former employer, and the organization responsible for creating the death maze in search of a cure to the virus. This makes Thomas angry. He tells Jansen that he will never trust Wicked again after they killed so many of his friends. Sometime later, the group sees that they are not the only ones here. There are dozens of others like them who seem to be immune from the virus and have been rescued from different mazes. The other teens are all waiting for new homes too. Every few days, Jansen will come into the cafeteria and read out a few names. These are the teens that he has found a safe home for, and they leave with him each time. That night, this boy Eris sneaks through the vents to visit Thomas in his bunk. He has been at the facility for the longest time out of everyone, and seems to know a few secrets. Following the boy through the vents, Thomas sees the facility's doctors transporting people in body bags into a room only accessible with a card. He's rattled. Clearly something is very wrong here, and the rescuers are hiding some sort of dark secret. During the next meal, Thomas approaches the guards and demands to see Teresa. They refuse, and even threaten him, asking that he sit back down. A fight breaks out, and Thomas's friends rush to back him up. Before any any real damage can be done, Jansen breaks up the fight and sends the boys back to their bunk. Thomas fills the others in on his plan. He thinks Jansen and his crew are the bad guys and has stolen an access card in the chaos. Thomas and Eris sneak back through the vents and enter the secure room using the card. Inside, they are horrified to find dozens of people hanging motionless and hooked up to medical devices. These are the teens Jansen has taken away. They're not dead, but completely unconscious and unresponsive. Okay, these teens have just fallen for the oldest trick in the book. They were focusing on Jansen's big smile and even bigger promises, but if they take a moment to examine how they're being treated, they would realize much sooner that Jansen is not who he claims to be. Thomas here already knows two things, that his friends are all immune to the virus, and that Wicked forced them into a death maze as part of an experiment to find a cure. The logical next step is for Wicked to take them out of the maze, run tests on them, and draw medical samples. This is exactly what Jansen is doing right now. If I were in Thomas's shoes, I would start looking for other similarities between Jansen's facility and Wicked. The first thing I would notice is that the facility I am in is massive, clean, and filled with coordinated employees. In fact, this facility even has massive sliding doors and medical serums very similar to the technology we have seen in the maze. They even have armed guards and have separated Teresa from the rest of us, just like how the maze creators only added her to the group weeks after the rest of the boys. These are way too many similarities to be a coincidence. The only explanation that makes sense here is that Jansen is a part of Wicked, and we are currently being held in a Wicked facility as the next phase of their sick experiment. This means that we cannot trust anything Jansen says, including that the kids he chooses each day are being saved. If we know Wicked wants to run tests on people who are immune, and these immune teens are disappearing, it's very likely that they're the unconscious people Thomas sees in front of them. They were brought into this lab in the body bags Thomas saw, and are now being exploited by Wicked to extract a cure. Since the teens are very outmatched, they cannot use brute force if they want to escape. Since Jansen has already given Thomas the chance to say that he's still loyal to Wicked, this shows the captors are still on the fence about him and may slip up. Thomas here should ask to see Jansen again and pretend to be coming around to Wicked's values. He should tell Jansen that Wicked isn't evil, they are just trying to save humanity by finding a cure. To seal the deal, Thomas can even say he's starting to remember more about his time working for them and that he misses Teresa and their time together under Wicked. The best lies incorporate slivers of the truth, and Jansen will be more likely to believe him here since it's clear Thomas does have feelings for Teresa. Once Wicked takes Thomas back into their inner circle, he will minimally have better access to all parts of the facility to plan an escape for his friends. Just then, Thomas and Eris hear the main door opening. They hide as Jansen walks in. The man makes a call to wicked Dr. Ava Page, who Thomas had previously been told was killed. Page demands that Jansen harvest all the remaining teens by the next day, and asks if he's managed to track down a resistance group called the Right Arm. They're anti-wicked guerrilla fighters who've already attacked several of their bases and rescued the immune test subjects that were being stored there. Reluctantly, the man tells her they know they live in the mountains, but nothing else. It's clear they could raid this facility, and the man agrees 
to process the kids, starting with Thomas's group. Stunned, the teen realizes that everything they have been told is a ruse. Jansen and the entire facility are part of Wicked, and they are all in grave danger. Rushing back to the bunk, Thomas warns his friends they need to leave right now. They barricade the door with a mattress and quickly escape through the vents. That's when Jansen's men barge into the room and realize they're trying to break out. Making it to another part of the facility, Eris has a clever idea that will help them escape, and goes back into the vents with another teen, while others continue making their way through the base. Thomas and his friends carry on and run into this wicked doctor, immediately taking her hostage. Heading down a hallway, one of Jansen's men quickly catches up to them and shoots at them with electric taser rounds. Mino here charges at the man and knocks him out. They quickly steal his weapon and enter the medical bay where they find Teresa. With all the friends finally reunited, they run as fast as they can and leave the room to break out of the facility. But there's a problem. This massive door is in the way and Thomas's card won't unlock it. Jansen and his men are close behind and have them cornered. It looks inevitable that Wicked is going to catch up and capture them with no hope of surviving their experiments. Suddenly, the door slides open. Eris has overridden the system and come to save them. Everyone rushes to the other side, with Thomas sliding in and narrowly avoiding being crushed by the massive door at the last second. Eris smashes the control panel and locks Jansen's crew inside the facility. Finally making it out of the base, the teens stumble into a vicious windstorm. They can barely see ahead of them as sand and fog is blowing everywhere. After running up a dune, they find an abandoned mall and sneak in through a broken window. Inside, they make a plan to try and reach the right arm, a resistance group working against Wicked and said to be living in the mountains nearby. It's the only thing they can do at this point to survive, but then one of the boys discovers something strange. On the ground are footprints left in the sand, and it's a clear sign that someone has been here. Following the tracks, they discover an abandoned survivor's camp that's full of supplies, and Thomas tells them to gather what they need for the journey while he goes looking for more resources. Heading out with Mino, he splits up from the group as everyone searches the mall. Looking around, there are many signs of life, such as beddings, toys, and food. They spot a dead body sitting in a chair with a lamp facing them, and after turning the lamp's switches, Mino realizes that the building has working electricity. The boys go to the generator room, and Mino turns it on, activating all the lights in the mall, but this was his biggest mistake. They hear growling nearby, and suddenly a zombie-like creature tries to rush at them from behind the fence. To make matters worse, more of them are coming out of hiding spots within the mall and chase after the boys. The lights have alerted these monsters, and there are way too many of them. Terrified, Thomas and Mino rush back to their friends, with the zombies close behind. Seeing these horrifying creatures for the first time, the rest gather up their supplies and start to run as well. Okay, Mino here is a complete idiot. Turning on the power is the worst possible thing he could have done. Looking back at their current objective, the friends want to gather basic supplies, then quickly head out to find the right arm. Having power would not help at all. In fact, since they are split up, Mino has no idea where his friends are. If any of them are currently crawling through elevator shafts or under mechanical doors, activating these features could mean that they get crushed without warning. Thomas here should have pointed out to his simple-minded friend that they already have flashlights and are in a mall where there are literally massive signs showing what each shop is and what supplies they may have. Powering the lights offers no benefit. The only thing this accomplishes is alerting the wicked soldiers searching for them right outside, as well as any enemies hiding in the mall that they are here. And this is exactly what happens. Turning on the power only shines a spotlight on them as an all-you-can-eat buffet for every zombie in a one-mile radius. It might be a massive risk, but what the group should have done is try to sneak back into the facility. Jansen and his men will want to devote all resources searching for them. It is nighttime and there's a sandstorm, which lowers visibility. With every second that passes, the teens may have run even further away from the facility. The search party will need to spread themselves out over a huge area in order to leave no stone unturned. This is why Jansen has likely sent every soldier he has out of the facility to overcome these factors and find the teens. Knowing this, Jansen would never expect Thomas to be cunning enough to double back and lead his group back to the scary place they have just escaped from. Thomas's group have all developed athletic and survival skills from being trapped in a death base where they were forced to survive all by themselves. Once inside, they can easily overpower any doctors and scientists who have stayed behind and steal their access cards and the facility's arsenal of weapons. They should also make it a priority to expose the secret lab full of unconscious bodies to the remaining teens trapped in the facility. Using the facility's intercom and teleconferencing system, or even something as simple as a camera phone, Thomas should show the other captives who Jansen really is and what Wicked has already done to the others. This gives Thomas the chance to easily triple their group size if the other teens choose to join him. At the very least, it will spook the others enough to cause total pandemonium, so Jansen focuses on them instead and stops coming after to our group. The last thing Thomas should do is look for the facility's garage. Jansen has vehicles that make it much easier to travel across the rough and unforgiving terrain. If Thomas and his friends can get their hands on some of them, their journey to find the right arm will be much easier.
The group makes it up several stories using these escalators, but are quickly overwhelmed. They fend off the fierce zombies with pipes and hammers, but they just keep coming no matter what they do. When this teen is tackled by a zombie, Thomas kicks it through the safety glass and it falls to its death. The survivors continue running, heading down this hallway, but just as they finally make it to the exit, they are terrified to find it locked. This boy volunteers to hold off the charging horde while his friends kick down the door. He fires at everything that comes down the corridor, but there are too many of them and they are gaining ground fast. The survivors manage to break the door open, but the volunteer is too slow and gets dragged to the ground by the zombies. They claw at his stomach and try to rip him open as his friends try to pull him away. He finally gets free, but is badly injured and has to be carried by the others. The friends make it out of the mall and take cover under a highway bridge. They force themselves to stay quiet as zombies try to look for them nearby, but the teens manage to stay hidden through the night. The next morning, the teens awaken to find that the zombies have left and head out, continuing their journey to find the right arm. As they walk through the city, they see that everything is in ruins. Buildings are completely abandoned and skyscrapers have crumbled to rubble that is now littering the street. It doesn't seem like anyone's lived here for years, but that's when Thomas hears a noise in the distance and tells everyone to hide. They crawl underneath some debris before they can be caught by three wicked aircraft flying overhead. Jansen has not given up looking for them and is now using planes to scout the entire city to hunt them down. They travel onward and make it to these sand dunes, spawning the mountains in the distance. They're about to move on when the injured boy collapses. His condition is getting worse, but the only way they're all going to survive is if they continue. With no way this poor boy can walk any further, the others create a stretcher for him and drag him behind them. They stop for a break and Teresa goes to check on Thomas so they can talk. She shows him these strange markings on the back of her neck, revealing she's regained her memories and now knows why they were working for Wicked. They used to think working with Wicked was the only way to find a cure for the virus. She then drops a bombshell. She thinks they should surrender and go back to Wicked. Thomas is shocked and can't believe what he's hearing. Before he can reply, a gunshot rings out of their camp and the pair rush back to find out what is going on. The injured boy has wrestled a gun away from one of his friends, but now he's weak and puking blood. Falling to the ground, he shows them that the scratches on his stomach have turned black and spread to his entire body. He begs them to let him end his own suffering. Taking a moment to think about it, his friends realize they have no other choice and say a tearful goodbye to him, leaving the gun with the boy before leaving. After the group has made it a short distance away, they hear a gunshot and know that their friend has died. Okay, this boy's death is heartbreaking, but Thomas has missed something far more important. The teens are all supposed to be immune from the virus, but their friend here just got infected like anyone else from being in contact with the zombies. This is a massive setback because it means they will now have to take precautions as if they are fully vulnerable to the virus and its effects. If I were in Thomas's shoes, I would immediately tell everyone to stop and check each other for wounds that have drawn blood. The zombies broke the skin of her friend, and that is how they transferred the virus to him. Anyone else who has open wounds is likely to be infected too. I would instruct the rest to keep an eye on each other. We have seen firsthand that the symptoms of infection are discoloration of the skin, trembling, loss of balance, and vomit. If anyone starts showing these symptoms, then it will be the best choice to lock them away, or at least leave them behind so they can't become a risk of infecting us too. I would also tell everyone to keep the fact that we can get infected a complete secret. Even when Wicked were desperate to stop us from escaping their facility, they could only use non-lethal guns because people who are immune are so rare and they need us alive in order to run further tests tests and develop their cure. Wicked has already been patrolling the city with aircraft, and the fact that they need us alive is the only thing stopping them from carpet bombing entire sections of the city from above in an effort to wipe out anyone who opposes them. If somebody in the group is captured, or if we encounter any other survivors in the wild, it is crucial that they continue to believe we are fully immune. If our enemies think they can use our natural immunity to develop a cure for themselves, we will always have the upper hand because we will be willing to kill them, but they need to keep us alive. The infection isn't the only thing that Thomas missed. As the de facto leader of his crew, he really needed to deal with what Teresa told him. It is common sense that anyone who wants to go back to Wicked has a different goal from the rest of the group. Before he can go any further with her, Thomas needs to make sure Teresa's loyalty lies in the right place. This is the woman who once worked for Wicked out of her own free will. This means that even if she has lost her memory, Teresa at the very least has some personality traits and values that align with what Wicked is doing. In addition, she's the only one that was separated from the group back at the facility with many days unaccounted for. Thomas doesn't know how much of her memory or former personality has been restored or what persuasions Jansen has filled her head with. While she may not be a bad person, it's clear that Teresa is not 100% aligned with our objective to escape Wicked. This makes her a liability who needs to be left behind. The next day, after trekking through the harsh wasteland all day, the teens find their supplies
supplies running low. As night falls, they try to sleep on the bare desert ground while trembling in the cold, but then Thomas hears a rumbling in the distance and senses danger. He yells for his friends to get up. Scrambling awake, they see dark clouds forming overhead and terrifying lights in the distance. It's a lightning storm headed straight for them. The survivors run as fast as they can when they spot a warehouse nearby and run for cover. It's too late. The storm has caught up and deadly bolts of lightning strike the ground around them as they sprint through the sand. Suddenly, a bolt strikes Mino, knocking both him and Thomas to the ground. With ringing ears and blurred vision, Thomas sees his friend lying motionless with smoke rising off his body. The others work together to help both injured survivors inside the warehouse. Placing Mino on the ground, they are relieved to find that he's alive, but Teresa senses something strange. That's when a chained zombie rushes at them, and more of them charge at the teens, furiously trying to attack them. Luckily, the chains around their necks stop them before they can cause any harm, and the commotion alerts a girl who approaches the survivors. Brenda here explains that the chained zombies are their guard dogs, who will alert them of any intruders, and takes them through the facility where a whole community of people are hiding out. Eventually, they meet this man Jorge. He's the leader of this facility and is close with Brenda, treating her like a daughter. Jorge is immediately suspicious of the group and demands to know where they're going, where they came from, and what he gains from helping them. The team reveals they're looking for the right arm resistance groups, but when they refuse to answer where they came from, his men grab them. The leader scans Thomas's neck with a device and realizes he's been tagged by Wicked, meaning he knows exactly how to use them. The survivors are hung by their feet over a large pit, where Jorge starts to interrogate them, revealing that his men want to sell the teens back to Wicked, but he would rather help them in exchange for information on the right arm. He lowers the ropes, and Thomas tells them the organization is hiding in the mountains, but doesn't know anything else. With that, the man heads back to his office to pack his things away, where Brenda finds him and asks Jorge what he's doing. He explains that the teens might be their ticket to finally join the right arm, since showing up with immune people will catch the right arm's attention. They make a plan to stick with each other, but leave everyone else in their community behind in order to take the friends to the right arm. Without warning, helicopters surround the building. Jansen has found them. Through loudspeakers, he demands the occupants hand over the teens or face the wrath of Wicked, and all the other survivors in Jorge's community flee out of the building in terror. This bald survivor is especially eager to work with Wicked and speaks to Jansen through a walkie-talkie, telling him that he will retrieve the teens. When the bald man arrives at the pit, he finds that the teens have already swung each other to safety and freed themselves from the ropes. Acting quickly, Thomas tries to disarm him and fights for the shotgun, but the man gets the upper hand. He's about to kill Thomas when Brenda arrives and shoots him from behind, saving the boy's life. Okay, these teens are too trusting for their own good. With extremely limited resources and danger around every corner, this world is ruled by self-preservation. This means that people have the incentive to lie to them for their own gain. The friends should look beyond what Jorge and Brenda say and consider what their actions reveal about them. The pit that Jorge has dangled them over is almost certainly a fatal drop, especially when falling head first because they are hanging upside down. Both the ropes used and pulley system are old and untested, running the risk of breaking and dropping them at any moment. The risk is multiplied by six, considering that Jorge has done this to all six teens. This shows that Jorge and Brenda are not currently loyal to Thomas's crew and don't care if any of them die by accident. Even worse, they have been left hanging upside down despite giving Jorge the information he wanted. Hanging upside down for extended periods have been associated associated with severe health risks or even death. As blood pools in the brain and heavier organs press down in the lungs, any of the captives could develop a brain hemorrhage, slowly suffocate, or have their hearts give out. In fact, heart failure is the leading cause of death in people trapped upside down for long periods. The warehouse's guard zombies are also left to roam freely within the range of their chains, with no one bothering to set up guardrails or obstacles to ensure they don't infect innocent visitors. All this shows that Jorge and Brenda are at best careless about the lives of others and aren't genuinely interested in the help anyone unless it also benefits them in a significant way. If I were Thomas here, I would take the option for them to betray us completely off the table. I would let them know that if they sell my friends and I back to Wicked, I would make certain that Jansen has reason to come after them to eliminate them for good. I would threaten to give Wicked all the inside information I have about their warehouse hideout and their physical descriptions. I would then tell Jansen that Jorge and Brenda are sympathizers to the right arm, which is close to the truth. Given how ruthless Jansen is, it is not hard to believe that he would either want to kill them as potential threats or capture and torture them for information about the right arm. This makes any attempt for Jorge and Brenda to cooperate with Wicked a death sentence for themselves. I may not actually be willing to be that ruthless, but so long as they believe I am, it would be in their best interest to do what we want and help us find the right arm. The beauty of this approach is that Thomas does not even have to rely on Jorge and Brenda being good people. Even if they are self-serving like most residents of this world are, it becomes aligned with their selfish interests to help Thomas and his friends out. Meanwhile, in his office, Jorge quickly plays a 
song in his record player and broadcasts it all over the facility. This acts as a detonation countdown, which will set off explosives he has placed all over the warehouse. Brenda heads to the top floor, leading the teens to Jorge, where he shows them he has prepared a zipline, which they can use to reach a nearby building. Knowing that Jorge can take them to the right arm, the friends grab onto rope loops and take this massive leap of faith. One by one, they ride down the zipline to the other building. Jansen spots them and orders his men to storm the top floor where they are. Suddenly, Brenda sprints away from them and Thomas decides to follow after her, knowing they're running out of time. He finds her in the office searching for something in a desk and they try to go back, but wicked soldiers are blocking the way. The teenagers are forced to make a break for it and get cornered in by the goons, but that's when the song reaches the end. It triggers the explosives throughout the facility. The blasts take out many of the support beams on the lower floor, causing entire sections of the building to crumble down. Thomas and Brenda evade the soldiers and leap down an elevator shaft to safety, just as the whole building collapses around them. With Jansen's men now dead, the pair headed to the sewers to catch up with Jorge. As they walk through the dark tunnels, they see that large portions of the wall are covered with red and infectious looking tendrils. They have no idea what it is, but then they hear a sound coming from this pipe. A rat startles them and they watch as it runs along the tunnel. Suddenly, a hand emerges from the tendrils and grabs the rat. It's a rotting zombie with squirming veins, branching out from its body. It bites the rat's head off and starts to chew as dozen more of these zombies emerge from the sewers. They know Thomas and Brenda are nearby and will stop at nothing from getting their next meal. Running out of the sewers, the pair find the path abruptly stops and have no choice but climb into a toppled skyscraper. The zombies are close behind, swiping at them many times as they try to make their way up a crooked stairwell. Thomas and Brenda are tough and both manage to knock several zombies down several stories to their death. Just as Brenda reaches for the railing at the top, it breaks off under her weight. The woman falls through the air and crashes down into a pane of fragile glass. Regaining her senses, Brenda looks behind her to see that the only thing between her and a lethal drop to the rocks below is a thin sheet of glass, which is already cracking. Thomas makes his way down and reaches for Brenda. Standing up, the girl can hardly move without the glass cracking even more. She reaches for Thomas but can't quite take his hand. Suddenly, one final zombie appears in the doorway. It is out for blood and headed straight for Brenda. The woman knows she's as good as doomed if it gets her. Okay, this woman clearly has a death wish. She's doing everything possible to ensure that the glass breaks and she falls to her death. Even a simple grasp of physics should tell her that standing up is the worst possible thing she can do. Her entire body weight is now concentrated on the two small areas where her feet are placed. This exerts more pressure on weak spots and the already cracked glass. Brenda here should instead continue to lie flat on her back. The average surface area for an adult woman laying down is 8.6 square feet, whereas the combined surface area of both her feet is less than one square foot. This means that she can reduce the pressure on the glass by simply laying flat and waiting for Thomas to get to her with the rope. The safest way for her to move would actually be rolling like a log or inching sideways like a starfish. These might look silly, but they are her best shot at maintaining a large surface area in contact with the glass while making her way towards safer panes or steady ground. If she absolutely needs to stand up, placing her feet in the middle of the glass pane is a huge mistake. The glass pane here works like a lever, with the area where the glass is fused with the metal frame being the fulcrum point. If Brenda stands in the center of the pane, she is as far away from the fulcrum as possible, meaning the glass has to exert the maximum amount of resistive force to support her weight. She should instead keep her feet as close to the fulcrum point as possible, and even place her feet on two different panes to cut the pressure on each panel in half. Frankly, it should not have even have gone to this point. These zombies are extremely dumb and do not seem to have any heightened senses. Back in Jorge's warehouse, the guard dog zombies could not even detect the teens in the dark till they were a few feet away. The shopping mall zombies also could not use their sense of smell or hearing to detect their prey, hiding a short distance away. This means our running is one of the least effective options for dealing with zombies, because we would be up against enemies who do not feel pain or exhaustion. Thomas here should have tried to outsmart them from the very beginning. This mountain of rubble could have been used against the horde. The zombies have no sense of personal safety, and this one even knocks its buddy off a ledge by accident. If Thomas had stopped running and started kicking loose the large blocks of debris the zombies are climbing, they would just continue climbing straight into the falling hazards and be knocked off. As a last resort, Thomas and Brenda can even climb below this ledge here and hang onto the wall. The zombies are clumsy and very unlikely to know any rock climbing techniques. They would just charge over the edge trying to get to the pair. The zombie leaps onto Brenda. She fights it off, kicking and flailing to stop it from biting her. Thomas grabs a nearby pole and slides down to Brenda. Thinking quickly, he grabs her hand and shatters the glass pane, supporting her. The zombie plunges to the jagged rocks below, while he keeps a firm grip on Brenda and pulls her to safety. With all the sewer zombies dead, the pair head back to street level, but Brenda slumps to the ground. 
pulling up her pant leg and shows Thomas the gashes the zombie gave her. They both know that it is now only a matter of time before the infection takes her over, but decide to carry on anyway. Sometime later, they reach a community of survivors and look for a smuggler named Marcus. He's a man who's had a history of transporting kids to the mountains, and she knows Jorge will be looking for him too. Walking around, they approach this strange man looking for someone who can lead them to the right arm and their friends. He tells them that those people are inside his party, but insists they have to drink from a flask of unknown liquid to enter his club if they want more information. Desperate to find their friends, they do it, but this will be a big mistake. In the club, they see survivors dancing and partying, but can't spot their friends. That's when Thomas feels the effects of the drink against Groggy. Stumbling around in confusion, Brenda gets close to him, saying that they may only have each other now, and pulls him in for a kiss. Though Thomas kisses her back for some time, he eventually pulls away and hallucinates he's seeing Teresa. He tells Brenda that he's already in love with someone else, and she walks away in frustration. The kid tries to follow her, but has horrific visions of his friends, and falls to the ground before quickly passing out. Sometime later, Thomas wakes up and is instantly greeted by a welcome sight. The others have found him, and everyone is safe. Looking around, he sees Jorge as the strange man tied up nearby, and is beating him for information, revealing this guy is Marcus. After some persuasion, the group finally learns where they can find the right arm. Following the directions, they drive far into the mountains, but then they encounter a problem. A line of abandoned cars are blocking the road, and they have no choice but to make their way forward on foot. That's when Thomas notices a bolt hole in one of the cars, but doesn't have a chance to warn his friend as snipers start firing at everyone. The group ducks behind the cars for cover, but can't see where the shots are coming from. There are high mountain ridges all around them, and bullets seem to be coming from all directions, but Jorge has an idea. He hands a bomb to Thomas and takes out a detonator. He wants Thomas to throw the bomb towards the shots, where he can set it off and cause a distraction. Before Thomas can throw the bomb, two masked girls sneak up on them and tell them to drop the bomb. With rifles aimed at Thomas and Jorge, they order everyone to get out from their hiding spots. Okay, everything about this setup screamed trap, but these survivors still walked right into the ambush. Thomas should have considered what he knows about the right arm. These are a group of rebels in hiding from Wicked, which has seemingly unending resources to track them. It makes sense that they are very paranoid about anyone finding their base, and would have deadly security measures in place to stop intruders. In fact, the survivors are very lucky that all they encountered were human snipers, and not something more deadly like landmines or bombs planted in the abandoned cars they have to squeeze past to make it further along the road. The first thing they should do is bring a familiar face, like Marcus along. He already knows enough about the right arm to know where to find them. Even if the right arm aren't on the best terms with them, they would know for certain that he would not associate with Wicked, their ultimate enemies. They should also have made their vehicle look as non-military and beat up as possible, something that the right arm would be convinced that Wicked's soldiers would not be caught dead in. If they sent the strange men ahead of the main group to vouch for them, the right arm could have been persuaded not to defend their base with potentially deadly force. If I were Thomas, I would also notice right away that the abandoned cars create a deliberate choke point, which forces people to get out of the safety of their vehicles and continue on foot. This section of road is also very vulnerable, because it is flanked on all sides by high ridges where enemies can scout or shoot from. Seeing this, I would insist that my group not continue under the ridges. Instead, we can camp some distance away from the choke point and send out a scout to climb the ridge and report back on if there are any guards stationed there. This boy Eris would be perfect for the job. We already see that he is very sneaky and nimble, managing to make his way around the wicked facility using the air vents, completely undetected. The boy is also resourceful, knowing that he had to split up from the main group in order to open the outer door. If Eris sneaks up and manages to catch one of the guards alone on the ridge, this gives him the chance to talk to the right arm without exchanging gunfire and explain that they are all on the same side. Even if they do not believe him at first, Eris can show them the tattoos all victims of Wicked have been branded with on the back of his neck. These tattoos contain vital information such as where Eris is meant to be imprisoned, as well as that he's immune to the virus. This makes him and his friends very valuable to the right arm, people they would definitely want to join them in their fight against Wicked and mission to stay free. With all the survivors cornered, the masked girls look like they are about to shoot them, but at the last second, one of the women recognizes Eris. They are relieved to see him and rush up to hug him. These girls were part of Eris's group in the Death Mace. They trust Eris and know that the group he's traveling with has to be trusted too. The girls remove their mask and whistle a signal up into the ridges. Thomas looks up and spots a bunch of snipers emerging from the ledge above them. With that out of the way, the group is finally taken to the right arm organization, who run an outpost surrounded by stone ridges and are brought to meet the leader, Vince. The man comes out to greet them, but then he notices that something is wrong with Brenda. She starts to shake and collapse into the floor. Checking on her, the
the leader spots her infected leg and draws his gun. He knows that any infected person is a threat to his entire community, and Thomas tries to bargain for her life, but it's no use. Just before the leader can kill Brenda, the outpost doctor steps forward and says there is a way to save her. This woman recognizes Thomas, explaining that she was a former Wicked employee just like him, and that he was the one who leaked the locations of every experiment being run to the rebels. The doctor heads to the infirmary so the girl can be treated, and has Thomas come along. She knows that his blood can help Brenda, as it can be used to make a serum that reverses the effects of the virus for a few months. After creating the serum, she gives Brenda the injection and insists there's not much else they can do for her. As the teens settle in, Thomas spots Teresa alone on a ledge above them. He joins her and they talk while watching the sun set. The girl shares a story about how her mother got infected with the flare virus and ended up clawing out her own eyes. She says that this is happening to millions of people around the world and that they have to do something to stop it. Looking heartbroken, Teresa explains that Wicked is the only way mankind can develop a cure and begs Thomas to understand why she did what she did. Did. Thomas is horrified, spotting lights in the distance getting closer, and realizes that she has given Wicked their location. Teresa asks him to stop trying to fight them and just go with them, as helicopters start to fly towards the outpost. Thomas scrambles back to the outpost, only to see it being blown up by rockets fired by the aircraft. Wicked soldiers storm the outpost, subduing everyone in their way. The right-armed leader rushes for a heavy machine gun mounted on a truck. He starts to load ammo into the weapon as Thomas's friends stay nearby and provide cover fire. Before he can shoot, a Wicked soldier throws an electric grenade which explodes and shocks them all unconscious. Thomas watches all this helplessly as he hides nearby with Jorge and Brenda. He tells them to save themselves because Wicked isn't after them. They reluctantly agree, leaving Thomas to look around for any idea on how he can save his friends. Okay, this is terrifying. Wicked claims to be trying to save humanity, yet they are willing to fire rockets into this community of people with zero care who they kill. It is clear they are out for blood, and the survivors will have to be equally ruthless to beat them. If Teresa is seeing all of this and still on Wicked's side, then she's a lost cause. This means that Thomas needs to let go of his feelings for her, and can use her against their enemies without feeling guilty. If I were in his shoes, I would pretend to agree with her, and promise that I will go with Wicked willingly. This gives me the chance to pick up my backpack and hand Teresa's hers as a gesture that we are ready to go back to our old lives. Except I would plant this bomb in Teresa's bag while keeping the detonator with me. It's small enough to hide in my shoe or waistband, places the soldiers would not think to search. Wicked may be suspicious of my change of heart, but they know that Teresa has always been in their pocket and will not check her bag. Once Teresa gets close to key leaders like Jansen or even Ava Page back at the Wicked headquarters, this is the perfect opportunity to trigger the bomb and get rid of all of her problems at the same time. With Page dead, Wicked may have no further capabilities to research a cure by exploiting teenagers and might abandon the project entirely. Even without this secret plan to blow Wicked up from the inside, the rebels are morons for not using the terrain around them to their full advantage. The outpost is surrounded by ridges which can serve as lookout points and the right arm is known to send their men to these high spots. There's even one right beside their base, which Teresa was standing on. This cliff would have been the perfect place to station a lookout armed with an anti-aircraft rocket launcher who could have prevented the entire attack before it even begins. Helicopters are notoriously one of the most unsafe modes of transport in the world. Even if they don't have heavy artillery, a few well-placed shots from a rifle into its engine would cause the wicked choppers to crash before they can do any real harm. Another advantage the right arm has over the soldiers is that this is the first ever time wicked is seeing their outpost and community. Instead of fleeing or trying to fight back through brute force, Thomas and the outpost leader need to be more cunning. Knowing that Wicked's main objective is to capture the teens alive and run further experiments on them, Thomas here should tell the right arm leader to order most of his men to hide in the surrounding tents and pretend to take him hostage. If Wicked genuinely believes he's willing to kill the boy, they'll be desperate to get up close to negotiate. That's when the men in the tents can spring an ambush and turn the tides on the soldiers. Later that night, the Wicked soldiers capture everyone in the outpost and force them to kneel on the ground. As Jansen takes count of his new captives, Thomas yells out to him and lets himself get captured. The man punches him in the stomach and makes him join the other prisoners. That's when a new transport craft arrives, carrying Dr. Ava Page and even more soldiers. She approaches the group and Teresa joins Page. It's clear to the boys that she's betrayed them and given their location to Wicked. That's when the woman sees the outpost doctor, who asks her if she feels guilty for anything that she has done, but Page says that she doesn't. With one last look, Jansen draws his gun and kills the helpless woman. Overcome with rage at seeing his friend killed, the right art leader shouts at Jansen and Page. Thomas seizes the opportunity to break free of the soldier's grip and pulls Jorge's bomb out of his jacket. He places his thumb on the detonator and says that he would rather die than go back with Wicked as their prisoner. Thomas's three remaining friends stand by him, feeling the same way, and get close so that the bomb will kill them too. Jansen and Page panic. They beg the boys not to do it, but Thomas won't back down. Just as he's about to push the button and blow them all up, 
up. A truck speeds out of nowhere and rams into a helicopter. Jorge has returned to save them. Deadly shrapnel flies everywhere as the helicopter blows up, and the wicked soldiers disperse to take cover. Thomas throws the bomb at the soldiers and sets it off, allowing everyone to get free. Completely enraged, Jansen knocks Thomas to the ground and pulls out a pistol, ready to kill him for his interference. At the last moment, Brenda shoots Jansen in the shoulder and saves Thomas's life. A massive firefight erupts, with Jorge, Brenda, and all the outpost survivors exchanging gunfire with the soldiers. The leader gets to his machine gun and opens fire, mowing down many soldiers. The boys manage to take out a quite a few soldiers before Mino is hit with a taser round and falls over paralyzed. With the wicked soldiers regaining the upper hand, Thomas can do nothing to save them. The soldiers drag Mino back to the transport craft, and Thomas watches helplessly as the aircraft's doors shut on his friend before it flies away, leaving the rebels behind. The next day, the remaining survivors are devastated by their losses, but the leader is ready to move on and suggests they come with their group where it'll be safe. Thomas explains that he won't be joining them and wants to go back to Wicked to save Mino. His friends try to tell him that he stands no chance, but Thomas will not change his mind. His resolve eventually sways them all, and they agree to join him in rescuing Mino and taking Wicked down, and more importantly, ending the scourge of twin dystopian sci-fi movie adaptations before it's too late. But what do you think? How would you beat Maze Runner, The Scorch Tribes? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Be playlist for more videos like this. And don't forget that from now on, we'll be uploading on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Until next time, have a damn good day.